Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm very excited to host this FP&A Trends webinar. Managing high growth with dynamic forecasting at Dollar General. We have a fantastic case study to talk about how do you manage that high growth in this very, very dynamic environment and through forecasting. I'm so excited to say we have 404 registrants around the world, 48 countries are represented. So I'm really, really excited to say we have the world represented here with thought leadership and advancing our profession. Truly a global webinar. The agenda for today. So we're going to talk about, hey, how do you dynamic, how do you forecast in a very dynamic way in today's environment? We'll talk about the journey from static to dynamic FPA. We'll talk about how do you step back and say, I'm going to take a holistic approach that considers the models we use, the processes, the people, and the systems in order to be very successful. We'll talk about the lessons learned. Our, our expert panelists are going to share as they went through the journey, as they continue to go through their journey, what are the lessons learned. Importantly, we'll go through some con conclusions and recommendations in order for each of you to say, hey, what are some things you can implement? And we'll have a Q&A session. So I encourage you to please ask questions in the chat and we commit to answering as many in the, as, as possible in the webinar. And if we don't get to any, we will submit uh, via email answers to your questions. Okay, our expert panel for today, I'm gonna invite you to come on camera. And I'm gonna start with Bob DeBicke. So Bob DeBicke, based in New Jersey, near Philly in the US, over 30 years of experience. We're really looking forward to his thought leadership. He's the Senior Director, CPG and Retail Industry Solutions at Anaplan. Welcome, Bob. Hey, Ron, thanks for having me. Amazing. Okay, and next we're gonna have Gray Finney. So Gray is based in Nashville, Tennessee in the US. He has over seven years of experience. Uh, and his experience is phenomenal. So really looking forward to him sharing how his company in a very dynamic environment has grown in a significant way. Great, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Ron. Thrilled to be here. Fantastic. So I'm gonna invite you guys back on in a bit. And for myself, so I've got, you know, 20 years of experience in finance, mainly in fp &A. Uh, I'm based in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and I'm really excited because, I mean, I've worked for company, amazing companies like Kraft, Campbell's, Kruger Products, and I feel like our fp &A departments were quite effective. But if we were able to have this ability to fo forecast in real time, dynamic, decision-making on the fly with really good information, it would have been even more powerful. So really, really looking forward to hearing Gray recount his story. Okay, so the fp &A Trends Group. I continue to be impressed by Larissa and the expansion of the entire team. 30 cities, 16 countries, four continents. Uh, and really exciting, three new chapters, Austin, Miami, and Munich. So amazing to see us continue to uh, go across the world and share insights and, and advance our profession. There's lots available in FP&A education, online resources, webinars, workshops, uh, Board Connect projects, the ebook series, FP&A Trends Digest. Uh, and last but not least, strategic and advisory research, right? How do you stay on the cutting edge of artificial intelligence, machine learning? Uh, and importantly, there is a 2022 survey done post COVID with all the industry challenges that we're facing. So really important to get on the cutting edge and understand, hey, where are we now? And how can we take our respective organizations to the next level? A few housekeeping items for today. So we're gonna have a one hour, one hour webinar. We'll have two polls, really encourage you to vote as we open the polls a little later. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session, as I mentioned, uh, and this presentation will be available through handouts and a recording as well will be sent out. Uh, at the end of the session, we're gonna have a survey. This is the 125th webinar, so really excited about that. And we continue to look for ways to make it more and more valuable for you. Okay, we wanna really wanna thank our sponsor, Anna Plan, transform how you see, plan, and run the business. And just before we get to what I call the main event, which is Gray and Bob, uh, I wanna recount some of my experience. And I was thinking through my experience and, and did I work in a high growth environment? And the answer I came back with was, if you look at that coffee machine on the very left of the page, I was in Kraft Foods at the time and we had this cash cow, very mature roasting ground coffee business, the old Bruce, uh, drip style brew coffee making. And the 
industry went to one cup making, which was a massive transformation, massive capital investment, significant organizational changes. And that's where I remember even at that time, it was very, very difficult to manage a high growth business. And the world, you know, frankly was dynamic, but not as dynamic as it is now. And you think about how the world has changed so fast, COVID-19, rising inflation, supply chain challenges, a, gl a looming global recession. And I was talking to a CFO a friend of mine and he was talking about, hey, he's dealing with all of these things at the same time. So what's really exciting for me is, is as Gray and Bob talk about the Dollar General example, it's managing a high growth business in an extremely volatile time. So really, really exciting. Okay, so, so a good way to understand this is around the uncertainty cone by Paul Schumacher. Right. So if you think back, a lot of my experience was FPNA was planning a 12 month cycle, right? You had a budget or a forecast and you had a couple of interim large forecasts and month ends to manage it. And you had a relative amount of certainty. I mean, there's always dynamic environment, but that cone of certainty has really shrunk. So in my opinion, that traditional planning approach with a 12 month budget and a couple of interim forecasts is essentially obsolete which really helps me think through this example to talk about how we can we advance to really keep up with the changing times. So what is agile or dynamic fp &A planning? It's really, as I said, transforming from the old traditional methods. It's turning these, this crisis into an opportunity. There's always a seed of opportunity. And importantly, how do we always step back and say, are we creating organizational value? Are we really creating shareholder value, right? And this agile dynamic fp &A approach really helps us get there. Okay, and, and really, as you think about it, I talked at the beginning about a holistic approach. It's about how do we work with people through the organization? We'll talk about that in this case study. How do we ensure we have the right processes that are gonna enable us? How do we leverage technology and really make it an enabler? Uh, and importantly, communication, all the time, communicate, communicate, communicate. Okay, I'm gonna invite Gray and Bob to join me and we're gonna start with the Dollar General case study. So Gray, I believe you're gonna start the, the show. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> So again, my name is Gary Finney and I'm a senior financial analysis manager at a retail company based in the US called Dollar General. If you're not from the US, you've probably never heard of Dollar General, but I'm going to walk you through a bit of our story today and our evolving journey towards an integrated and dynamic forecasting system, as well as a few ways that we're managing through the uncertainty that I think uh, everyone here is probably living and working through. And this is a subject that I biasly find uh, particular interest particularly interesting and I hope you do as well but so again if you're not based in the US it's a uh, what Dollar General is is it's a, a low-cost convenience store that uh, if, if you've ever visited the state it's, it's really hard to uh, throw a stone really in any direction and not hit at least one we have over 18,000 stores currently open and are opening around a thousand new stores per year for the foreseeable future which makes it a def definitely a uh, complicated business to manage but Dollar General focuses on selling items like candy and snacks, fizzy drinks, toilet paper, cosmetics, as well as other consumable and non-consumable items, maybe similar to a, uh, a Spa or a Tesco Express if you're based in Europe. And it's definitely been a roller coaster ride at Dollar General over the last two and a half years with ongoing disruptions to our core business model from the pandemic and now the current inflationary environment that we're all living in. And we really would not have been able to accurately manage against these disruptions without a pretty broad-based dynamic forecasting framework. Okay. Yeah, I mean, great. Uh, it's really impressive to see what Dollar General has been able to do of late. And the fact that you open up a thousand stores every year, that's unbelievable. Um, but you hit on a couple things. I think roller coaster is a really good way to describe it. If you were to go online right now and search current state of retail, you'd find terms like retail apocalypse, right? Because over the last several, maybe 10 or 15 years, there's been a lot of change going on in the industry. Uh, first, it was moving from brick and mortar, or traditional platforms to e-commerce and the hybrid between the two. 
which was putting a lot of pressure on our retailers. Then it was, you know, moving from that to a pandemic, which literally shut things down overnight and forced many of our retail uh, friends to either restructure their businesses or, you know, partner up with somebody else or just sell all, all together and move on. And now we're dealing with uh, a lot of new and unprecedented things all converging at the same time. You mentioned a few of them. You know, we've got inflation rates out there, not just the the cost of products, but the cost of, of hiring and retaining workers in a store, for example, that has 20,000, almost 20,000 outlets. That continues to go up and there's no end in sight for this. And, and Ron hit on it before, this, you know, this, this economic global contraction that we're having. All the while, you still have to be relevant to your consumers and consumers today have accelerated their move from traditional in-store over to online and a hybrid version of that behavior as well. But the other thing about consumers that is so interesting of late is they want to literally be involved in every aspect of a product from its generation to its creation, to its shipping, to its marketing, and ultimately into their hands, you know, through things like uh, environmental concerns and social concerns. And all of these things are putting tremendous pressure and continue to put pressure on retail. And while all this continues to happen, we have choppy supply chains that have not yet been re uh, fixed. So we have, you know, I just was looking the other day at some of the announcements of some of the traditional um, retailers out there, some of the folks that, you know, are big and, and have been around for a long time. And many of them are 10, 20, 30% higher in inventory levels for the latest quarter versus what their traditional numbers have been, because they can't yet figure out how to forecast and fix that supply chain uh, visibility problem that they have. So now they're either stuck with that inventory or they have to find a way to push it out. So all of these things are conspiring against the success from a financial standpoint, because every decision that's made from our retail organizations are financially based, right? Whether you're in merchandising or whether you're in store operations or whether you're in traditional finance or supply chain, every decision that you make comes down to what are the dollars and cents and what are my resource availability? So in working with retailers over time, we've learned a few things that we believe to be proven practices that can help retailers from a financial standpoint and in general to deal with these changes. And these are the things that we consider to be things that retailers either need to get good at by you know, learning how to do it themselves, potentially partnering with others that know how to do it well, or just going out and finding you know, a way to acquire this capability in the marketplace. And it's these four things. It's the ability to look at your information, to look at your plans, and to look at your forecasts and models in real time. So you know, we were talking a minute ago about 12-month forecasts with relatively high predictability. I would argue that that's a great baseline nowadays, but you literally have to go in on a regular basis and see what's happening and what's changing and pivot when needed and uh, against a few different you know, scenarios that you might have pulled out. Uh, then this notion of being collaborative. So every decision that's made by one group or one line of business inside the overall chain of decision makers is visible to everybody else and everybody can see how a decision made upstream is impacting them downstream or vice versa, and what financial impact that's going to have on their business. And give them the right to say, hold on a second, hold up, you really wanna do that? Because it's not gonna help us from a turns perspective. It's not gonna help us from a, a Jim Roy perspective, whatever the metric is. This notion of being agile, so many of our retailers out there have been making trade-offs in the past and when it comes to things like looking at plans at a detailed level, because it was just too hard to look at that level of detail given the fact that many of them have tons and tons of SKUs. Well, the ability to look up and down, left and right, middle out, bottom up, top down, anytime you want, and to be able to make better decisions is something that every retailer is gonna to need to be able to do to stay alive in the future. And then finally, this notion of being dynamic to be able to look at your resources 
and apply the same kind of rigor that you would do um, on a annual plan or a specific category plan, but to do that with your people, to do that with your finances, and to leverage things like scenarios to take in all the possible information, come up with a, a few good places to focus on and then go forward with those and come back later on and see whether or not it worked out. So these are the four things that we think are really important and these are what's gonna drive not only surviving in this crazy environment, but literally thriving. Um, so Gray, you, you and Dollar General are doing a really good job right now. So I'd love to hear your perspective on those. Thanks, Bob. And th those four facets of digital FP&A that you highlighted are really front of mind for our FP&A team in Dollar General. So it's it's definitely been a long and still ongoing journey to get from our starting point maybe five years ago at a static and traditional FP&A model of forecast to that of an integrated and dynamic system that allows us to really have a holistic window to the organization and also unpack some traditionally siloed functions within. So with the amount of volatility we've seen over the last three years and definitely ramping up this year as we've moved into that inflationary and potentially recessionary environment. We've we've really striven to actively support a few of these strategic goals that we've got here. So I would say, first and foremost, maintaining our strategic growth while also reinforcing our position as that low cost operator. So as, as I'd said on the previous slide, we, we have 18, more than 18,000 stores open currently, and we'll be opening 1,000 stores per year, just about for uh, definitely the foreseeable future. But it's crucial to us to have that scalability in some of our systems, so to be able to account for that growth, as well as testing out those scenarios that you mentioned. So what does it look like if we build an extra 500 stores next year or 200 fewer? How does that impact the bottom line? And really that overall deep understanding of the business model to help us in what I would say FP&A's role should be in that uh, internal consultant advisory position within the business. So another key component that we're working through using some of these systems is really supporting our overall customer base. So as a, a discount retailer, our core customer is definitely on the lower end of the income spectrum and is particularly impacted by the current inflationary environment. We're also seeing <clears throat> what we would call recessionary trade downs of people that would maybe in normal times shop at a more expensive premium store that maybe sees the potential for a recession on the horizon and are really looking to seek those savings and stretch their dollar. I mean, like everyone else, we've seen those supply, strength, supply chain constraints. So much of our energy inventory comes from abroad and we definitely still see those lingering impacts of the pandemic on our supply chain as well as that gas price volatility that I think everyone has seen over the last half year or so. And additionally, we're striving to really maximize our labor productivity so both support that core customer base by providing them with the best service that we can as well as driving that top line growth in the most efficient way possible. And lastly, this is a somewhat new development for us. I think we had announced sometime last year, but we we are doing our, our first international expansion into Mexico a little bit slowly at first, but that's an additional wrinkle to our overall business model that it's really crucial for us to have those scalable models, be able to uh, directly interact with some of our international teams and that agility to reflect changes in the business environment in our procedures and in our models. All right, so expanding on the previous slide, really one of the key benefits of our dynamic forecasting system is that ability to support our strategic growth through improved insight and decision-making tools. So given Dollar General's rapid growth, plus the past two years of pandemic volatility and the current economic uncertainties, it's extremely important for us to be able to actively allocate resources through that dynamic and agile forecasting. So at a high level, our process is incorporating real-time updates on an ever-changing basis with planners making adjustments to their outlook for any given period within a year as often or as infrequently as information changes and becomes available on their end. So this actionable information that we're getting on a real-time basis really allows us to foster those 
those impactful discussions with leadership and allows us room to, I would say, quickly capitalize on wins while also minimizing losses and tracking that incrementality of those thousands and tens of thousands of changes within a year over time. So to, to give a high level example of, of how this process would work. So let's let's pretend on a, a Monday of any given week, we learn of delays at a primary US shipping port resulting in uh, a certain dollar amount of, of headwind to, to cost of goods sold and impacting our overall inventory availability. So as soon as we learn about this, we can pretty quickly use our tools to identify opportunity within the business to help offset some of this impact and manage back to that overall fiscal target that we're striving towards. So our FP&A team is focusing on some of the more high level analysis and also coordinating with some of our cross-functional planners to really look for that opportunity with deep within the business and anywhere that we can reallocate funds to support those strategic goals. So this might go on for a couple of days. Come Thursday, Friday, we're compiling our analysis and opportunity and we're presenting this information to our finance leadership who then pretty much immediately after will convey this information to the, the rest of the executive team who will discuss it and execute upon it. And the key point here is really the ability to do this all very quickly. So an example like this, especially over the past year, is, is something that uh, is, is very regular. And this is a maybe three to five days discussion and turnaround at a high level with execution in the field taking a bit longer. But from start to at least FP&A finish, it's a, it's a very quick turnaround. Wow, the new world. It, it, it's a blessing and a curse. It's more work, but you know, the system works well. So on the next few slides, I'm going to, at a high level, highlight the transition from our previous static state, which I'm guessing is, is what many of you are using today. And that's definitely where I started my career in FPNA to our what we would call our current dynamic state. So our, our former state of planning, again, is probably going to look pretty familiar to many of you, but it was uh, revenue, capital assumptions, earnings model, balance sheet processes, all siloed, limited connection and very limited connection between different teams. Hundreds, maybe thousands of Excel templates across a variety of uh, formats and uh, all managed through email. I, I definitely remember remember those times and, and not fondly, but using clunky and inefficient macros to aggregate some of this data, uh, having static forecasts that don't reflect real-time business information, definitely a high risk of error there due to the number of sources and overall limited insight into those underlying assumptions from what planning partners are providing you. And this, this definitely felt overwhelming. So FP&A resources at that time were primarily dedicated to the manual management of that data, almost more similar to, to accounting functions or, or data input. And our teams didn't have the skill set or the time to really focus on the, the more important uh, activity of interpreting the data and gaining that actionable intelligence from it. So, Without that ability to overcome these issues in our transition over the last few years to our current state, we I can't imagine how we would have managed through some of that volatility over the last three to five years from everything else that has come up. Looks looks to me, Gray, like it's easy now, easier anyway, to snap a new use case into this as needed compared to the old days. It's it's the so it's you're kind of um moving from one pocket to the other. It's easier to, to implement it, but having those tools and having the know-how to do it opens up for um, a lot more requests for how does it look if we do this or how does, what's the outlook here? So it's, it's more, um, it is, I think more meaningful activities, but it's, you, you, do, you do a job well, you, uh, you get a lot more on your plate kind of thing. Be careful what you ask for, right? <laughs> That's right. So moving on to our current state, uh, a few key characteristics here are integration across multiple platforms all through the cl all through the cloud. So we are working with sales and gross margin planners, supply chain owners, uh, expense planners, HR and headcount planning, as well as IT developers, and all of these teams are 
utilizing the same tool to to input their forecast and it all feeds to a central point that our FPNA team manages. So as we work to further expand this dynamic environment, we are hoping to add additional predictive analytics functionality and additional insight into the data that we'll highlight a little bit later. But uh, another key characteristic here is really that that important true ownership of the forecast by subject matter experts. So since it's a cloud-based tool and they're entering it on their own, they are the uh, there's a clear chain of custody here. So it all comes back to the planner that inputs it in. It is not somebody sending a um, half-functioning template to FPNA to then move to another spreadsheet. It's a very clear and direct line that works well for us. And connected to that is that that real-time forecast management. So as we learn of new information on um, natural gas prices or uh, wage expectations, things like that, our planners are really entering that in as soon as they know, or if we know first, we're reaching out to them to make sure that that's entered in um, as quickly as possible. But that that real-time management gives us multiple levers that can be pulled to to manage to our, our internal and external targets and really gives us that extreme level of detail for trend analysis and overall management of the business. All right. Okay, fantastic. Thank, thank you, Gray uh, and, and Bob. And, and what we're going to do now is we invite uh, the, uh, all the attendees to vote on the poll that I will be launching very shortly. Okay, so so the poll, and, and while we're doing this, as we go through the next section, I'd encourage you to all send in questions if you haven't already. So the poll is, how would you describe your current forecasting process? Is it A, static, not dynamic? Is it B, partially dynamic? For example, do you have some business drivers? Is it C, dynamic and collaborative, but not real time? Or D, is it dynamic, collaborative, and real time? So once again, the question is, how would you describe your current forecasting process? Is it A, static, not dynamic, B, partially dynamic, C, dynamic and collaborative, but not real time, or D, dynamic, collaborative and real time? I can see we're getting a fair amount of uh, respondents. We've got 57% of people responded. Perfect. I'm going to let it go a couple of seconds, and I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Please. Okay, okay, fantastic. And uh, as you see, just a super quick comment, Bob uh, and, and Gray, uh, on the results. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking back to all the, the conversations I've had in the last several years. And, you know, I, I find that this is kind of along the same lines. Uh, the, the, the heavy middle there is, is some degree of, of improvement, but um, certainly a long way to go. And then obviously there's a couple out there that are doing some pretty good things. And then there's some out there also that are not, you know, not yet on the, on the bus, so to speak. So fantastic. Kind of what I've seen. Yeah. Okay, cool. Gray, any, any quick thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would say this, um, this isn't, especially today, I don't think this is, is very surprising. I think maybe a couple of years ago, it definitely would have skewed more towards A and B than we have here. But Given all the turmoil that we're seeing in the marketplace today, it's um, I mean it, it, it's hard to to remain static and not be able to to incorporate some of that uh, more rapid changes that are constantly showing up in the economy. Fantastic! And for anyone who can't see it, if they're driving, for example, static dynamic or not dynamic was 16%, partially dynamic 42%, dynamic and collaborative not real time was 31%. And dynamic collaborative in real time was 11%. So again, as Bob and Gray said, glass half full. We've got lots of opportunities to continue. Thank you all for voting. Okay, so now we're going to move to the next section. We're going to continue the journey. Uh, Gray, continue on, and I'll pop in now and then with some questions for you. All right. Thank you, Ron. So over the next few slides, I'm going to outline some of the uh, advanced forecasting methods and the pretty new processes that we're, we're implementing currently to really help Dollar General drive value creation. And one overall, one of the key benefits of that implementation of the integrated and collaborative forecasting system that our team 
has managed is that uh, ability to focus less on some of those more manual tasks like aggregating spreadsheets and manually tracking uh, template to template and having 64 different versions of, of an Excel workbook to be able to focus more on some of this, uh, what, what we think to be uh, value adding analysis that really supports our strategic growth, growth goals by identifying gaps in the business model. To achieve this, we're, we're leveraging some statistical and advanced forecasting methods, as well as some novel financial modeling, uh, building dashboards to support our strategic goals, to be able to drill down and really look into the underlying drivers of the business. And the big focus at our, within our team is accurate forecasting of really anything that we can get our hands on within the, within the internal uh, company economy, using whatever means necessary. So what it's a little bit difficult to, to visualize, but this image here is, is an example of, of one of the processes that we have where we will have a, a, a planner provide their own forecast for, for any given item within the P&L. And we will have maybe five or six alternative forecasts that our team manages that are at a much higher level, but are built on using different assumptions. And we will meet with them routinely to say, okay, which forecast is more accurate? Uh, is what's missing in your model? How can we how can we improve things to provide that accuracy to really give us that better picture for how things are going to be to support that resource allocation? So if if a planner is continually missing, we don't want to remove the ownership of that forecast from them, but we see it as our role to to support them in improving their understanding of some of the maybe more statistical methods that we're using for other purposes to, to help them improve their overall accuracy. Yeah, I love that. And, and Gray, are you able to drill in on this data to say, hey, we, if we wanna get deeper in real time, we can? We can, yes. So this is, I think this is at a GL account level, but really with this functionality, we can set up a framework for essentially anything in the PNL. Amazing, that sounds awesome. All right, so continuing that discussion on what our, our next frontiers are for, uh, for FP&A as a group is one of the focuses is really driving the business using some driver-based forecasting methods as well as those advanced analytic tools to help us better align to forecast changes, adjustments to business strategy, and to help us quickly incorporate changes to the overall business model. So again, our fe a team today really acts largely as that internal consultant versus a, a spreadsheet manager. While some of the spreadsheet management is unavoidable, and I think probably will be for forever, we have largely been able to move away from a lot of that uh, more manual task and be able to focus on what I would say to be some of the more interesting analysis like we've been covering here. But what we're showing in this, this image is another example of uh, a multi-dimensional tool that we've created to help us really create a full forecast for the P&L using multiple and interchangeable methods. So similar to the that trend analysis, this is more long-term looking. So we pull in our data points and we can choose, do we want a forecast to be driven strictly by store growth, uh, keep it flat as a percentage of sales, maybe fix as it was last year plus inflation and carry that on to the future or do we have a, a manual override so for future planning so uh, many of you are probably getting ready for fiscal 23 planning but with a tool like this we're able to prior to having planners submit during whatever window i think uh, most people are probably using for plan to be able to answer some of the questions that I'm sure everybody's getting from leadership and that what is, what's the P&L going to look like next year when you don't have really anything else to base it off of. But so as planners are submitting these changes, we're then bouncing against here to really try to identify that gap between the assumptions and really reconcile what, what the gaps and the assumptions are and how do we best, best plan and allocate resources for the future. Amazing. I think you you call me a spreadsheet manager there because I, I remember a very linear Excel-based model where we used to send out templates and, and even just the act of consolidating them is, is pretty painful. So really encouraging to see a, a pretty live tool as you explain it. Yeah. And this um this it the additional cool thing about this, it links to our other systems. So it has actuals are changing, 
that all flows through and that all carries forward to our future expectations. So it really helps us keep that that rounded view of, of what could potentially happen. All right. So again, one of our main goals in the implementation of that dynamic forecasting system was agility overalls, to be able to quickly and accurately reflect changes in the business environment as they become known. So the real-time nature of our process means that planners are making new changes as new information becomes available. Um, no fixed timeline, so you could say, for example, I uh, think a number is going to be something based on a Federal Reserve report today, but then you read something next week that maybe changes your mind a bit. You are able to, to update that as any time that new information occurs. And while this does a little bit make it tricky in terms of tracking change to change, I think we've got a, a pretty rigid framework overall to help us keep that in line. And as these changes are coming through, we're presenting overall changes at the end of the week to leadership. And if there are gaps to our strategic target for the quarter for the year that we're seeing come up, our FE and team is making those recommendations for how to either offset um, potential headwinds that come up or capitalize on benefits um, that result in that change in knowledge. And then we're working to, with operations and different teams throughout the company to execute upon it. All right. So this is a, a bit a bridge, but this is kind of a um, an example of how our rolling and dynamic forecasting process works. So many of you are probably wondering how how we're able to to keep track of those ongoing changes week to week, and and I think this is as succinctly as we can explain it. But let's let's pretend this is over a uh, let's call it an eight day period. So let's say it's Monday of a uh, certain week. Sales planners, gross margin planners, and expense planners all learn new information within their respective regions. They are updating their forecasts in our model. And then for the next couple of days, our FBA team is reviewing those changes, working with the planners to better understand them, incorporating them into our overall and company wide earnings model, highlighting any risks or opportunities that may come from what planners are telling us, and then ultimately giving guidance on how we can meet or achieve, or really however we're trying to solve it, those internal and external expectations with our leadership. So let's pretend later on the week, period closes out, we're pulling actuals into our model, and then almost instantaneously comparing the, the differences between those actuals and what planners told us maybe four or five days previously, working with them to understand the, the expectation gaps there, and really, pretty quickly setting that new baseline to determine the validity of, of the outlook from that point forward. It all really starts over as we move into week two. They're learning new information, inputting it, and then all starts all over again. Amazing, yeah, and, I, and you know, for me, I think about, like, yes, I think back to my history, it was a very linear process and the planners would submit their information and they're essentially done, right? Whereas this, and you know, involves them throughout the process. So, so how was that process to ensure they're on board and providing that real-time information that you're talking about? So it was choppy at times, but um, I think we're in a very good spot today. So it's it's always gonna be difficult to convince um, someone that uh, that's not within your organization directly to to change what they do and to sell them on the 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 benefit of a, a brand new system. But I think over time we've been able to, to really point out to them that this centralized system and standardized template will make your job easier. This is one place that you have to look for this information. You can compare actuals versus uh, what you thought the forecast should have been at that point in time. And there's always that record of truth for this is what the number is. Perfect. No, I love that. And I can see the speed of how you guys move at is, is really, really powerful. All right. So this visual here gives a high level summary of really how some of our, our company-wide models are interconnected. So our fp a team is focused on really that middle point. So the net, what we call the net income model, it, it's our company-wide earnings model. And we're working with maybe uh, about a dozen different 
models using a somewhat standardized service across the across the company and they're all interconnected so gross margin team is making changes to to their forecast they can then either push it to our model or we can pull it directly from our end and that really that functionality really works across the board so we're able to set up those somewhat independent models for specific teams because it's not going to be one size fits all for everyone but it all feeds that central source of truth which really gives us um, it, at least from my experience unparalleled access to that overall information and insight into what's going on in the business all right so again a few of the the key benefits to moving to a system like this is that reduction of those manual processes. So I think now largely we're able to spend a significant amount, significantly more amount of time on focusing on the more interesting tasks. So looking at what's our three year, five year, 10 year strategy. What's, what does this scenario look like to our EPS or our cash flow generation over the next two years? and really working more with leadership into um, fleshing out those scenario building and providing that, that advisory on the direction of the business as opposed to those data entry and more manual tasks. Additionally, and really as a byproduct of the system itself is that improved insight into the business overall with detail and collaboration. So we are, working directly with planners and have a uh, coherent record of why a change to forecast was made and for what reason, when it was made, things like that, who made it, to really be able to allow us to, at any point in time, four or five months after the fact, look back and say, okay, this is why we did that specific action to better help us reconcile that information gap. Yeah, and no, this is really powerful in the sense that, you know, the opportunity of cost of some of the environments I've been in where you are on version 64 of that spreadsheet that you talked about, this is really powerful to say, look, we're, we're taking that time spent, which is really non-value added. And, you know, as you said before, working as a business consultant and helping the business move forward. It's really, really encouraging. Yeah, and I probably make it sound easier than it actually was, but I mean, we had a uh, a former vice president that was a, uh, a staunch champion of this framework. And thankfully, at least for the most part, we had pretty reasonable buy-in within the organization. And after a couple of years, it became part of the routine. It's what everyone expects. And um, that, that makes things, I think, a whole lot easier to, to manage. All right. So what's next for Dollar General on our journey towards a, a more dynamic framework? So we've definitely come a long way over the last five years moving from that traditional and static forecasting model to an integrated and dynamic one. But for our next frontier, I would say the we we want to focus more as an FPNA group on the on the big picture. So continuing to set FPNA strategy as that of that internal business consultant versus the data manager and aggregator. And we want to build out our FPNA skill set into the more statistical analysis, a lot more AI and predictive analytics, and instill a uh, a focus in the staff on that that ever important um, trait in asking why. So fostering that that intellectual curiosity within our team to really help us understand the business. So additionally, we're working towards uh, ever increasing our insight into the business and looking into the KPIs and other metrics that really drive the business to be able to provide the best recommendation and analysis and information that we can and really continuing to improve our overall resource allocation. So is just because someone tells us this is what the budget is or this is what forecast needs to be, our team having the the insight and the skill sets to be able to kick the tires and say, but is this the the right number? You're, I know that's what you're saying, but does that actually make sense within the, the framework of the business? So with the the going on five years now that I think we've we've had this system, a, a few of the conclusions we've drawn and the recommendations I would make is that moving to a dynamic forecast system like this. Uh, is definitely challenging. I mean, it, it has growing pains, but I would say it's well worth the effort uh, and you definitely reap those benefits 
over the long term and some of the smoothness of managing that forecast. So a critical learning that we found is you definitely need that buy-in from the organization. There's going to be people that are hesitant to change from some of the processes and uh, templates that they've used for years and possibly decades. But as soon as you get that buy-in, it definitely makes things run like a well-oiled machine. And also coordination with IT, especially for the implementation of maybe a dedicated FP&A tool or uh, a function of an ERP system is essential. I, I don't think um, even as, as smart as I think that we all are on our team, I don't think we could have implemented it in ourselves just because coding is not necessarily in most of our backgrounds, but having a good relationship with IT there definitely made our jobs easier. As far as selecting a forecasting tool, at least from our discussions and looking for something that would uh, fit well for Dollar General, is my, my perspective was look for something that solves a specific and tangible issue that you're, you're wanting to resolve as opposed to, to something that's one size fits all. I think lastly and most importantly, the, the selling point of leadership in implementing a system like this is the faster turnaround for forecast, the greater level of visibility into what is actually driving the business and those additional levers that FB&A can pull to, to drive business results and, and meet your internal targets. Fantastic, thank you very much, Gray. And, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll come back from after this poll with some conclusions and, and questions. So reminder, just if you have any questions, please submit them via the chat. And now what we're gonna do again is we, we'd love to get your thoughts on a poll question. Okay, so the poll is what is the primary software slash application leveraged by those involved in planning slash forecasting at your company? Is it A, Excel, B, a homegrown solution, C, an ERP module, D, a cloud-based FP&A BI CPM solution, or E, other? Once again, the question is, what is the primary software application leveraged by those involved in planning, forecasting at your company? Is it A, Excel, B, a homegrown solution, C, an ERP module, D, a cloud-based FP&A BI CPM solution, or E, other? And I thank you all for voting. Please continue to vote. I'll let the, the poll run for a little bit. Perfect, thank you all who voted. I'm now gonna close the poll and share the results. Okay, so, so the results we see, uh, A, Excel. So 52% voted have said Excel, 4% a homegrown solution, 10% an ERP module, 29% a cloud-based FP&A BI CPM, CPM model, or 4% and other. So thank you all for, for voting. Uh, Bob and Gray would love your quick comments on this. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised. Uh, Excel is very popular out there. Um, and as we're seeing in many of our customers, um, you know, ERP is, is not really crossed that chasm to being that enterprise-wide planning tool. Um, there are some folks out there that are, you know, like Anaplan that does cloud-based FP&A, et cetera, but, this makes sense to me, um, homegrown solutions, obviously, but I think that number continues to decrease. Yeah, this totally makes sense and it's in line with what I've seen. Amazing. Gray, any quick comments from you? I think that makes sense as well. I, I'm a bit surprised. I would have expected the ERP versus the cloud-based FP&A to be more, more swapped, but uh, personally, I, I think I lean more towards D in my preference, so I guess that does make a bit of sense, but I'm not surprised at all by the Excel results. I uh, I think I'm, I'm one of those uh, psychopaths that sees Excel as a, a, a warm, comforting blanket, so I, I get that, but um, I think that makes sense overall. Fantastic. Okay, perfect. So, so now, you know, uh, I, I totally agree. 52%. Again, I think there's massive opportunity for us. So Bob and Gray, I mean, I think we've had some really good discussion. I'd love your quick key takeaways. So Bob, let's start with you on, on kind of what you're thinking as, we, as we've gone through this. Yeah, so 
I love the stuff that Gray was talking about because it is an example of how a retail finance organization has been able to navigate some pretty challenging waters uh, with what they're doing. And everything he went through was very, and it, to everybody out there, this can be done and it can be done effectively. Like you can survive, you can thrive, regardless of what the market continues to throw at you. And I think, you know, going back to the fundamentals of, like you said earlier on, Ron, get your process identified, get your data in line and look to utilizing some capabilities either that you can develop or, or find in the marketplace to bring all that together and allow you to have that visibility, allow you to have that collaboration and allow you to look at things, you know, rather than, you know, annually, uh, look at them daily, weekly, whatever makes sense for your business. And those minor stepped improvements will yield dramatic results from a sales perspective, from a profit perspective, from a turns perspective. It's almost a requirement at this point. You know, you have to think about these things going forward. Perfect, thank you. I love that ROI-based approach to it. Great, what about you? Sure, so, so having um, been on both sides, so both the fully Excel to the uh, almost complete integration across the business, it's, admitting bias here it, it's definitely worth it it's it makes i think our jobs a for the most part a whole lot easier and really allows us to focus on again that more interesting and impactful work so doing the the analysis into the business model working with cross-functional partners on on strategy so instead of manually aggregating and managing that data it's what does what does this initiative do to Due to our company's valuation is it value accretive or value dilutive how does it look if we if we alter it x y and z and i don't think our team would really be able to to focus on building out those those more consultant like skill sets without having to to lose a lot of those those manual processes or at least replace them replace them with uh, some sort of automation that really makes things run a whole lot more smoothly yeah, no, I, I absolutely love how you're talking about, you know, you're now adding value to the organization, you know, shareholder value. And then, you know, Bob talked about top line bottom results. It, it's really around us being that value added as opposed to, hey, being in the background, you, you know, spreadsheet managers is the word you use. So I, I lo absolutely love that. Yeah, you're okay, playing so, at the field. Sorry, Ron, you're playing at a different level now. Exactly, which is, which is so encouraging. Okay, so thank you to all who submitted questions. I'm going to now ask my amazing panel, some questions. Uh, and the first one is gonna go to Grace. So uh, amazing question. How do you ensure that the results from the dollar general forecast make sense? What are the checks and how often does the board expect forecasts to be delivered? So I don't think we, I, we, let me start at the back of the question. So at least for our board, they they see the the annual budget, but they they don't necessarily see the the day to day forecast changes. So our leadership is is meeting with them regularly to talk about high level outlook. But I think we have a a pretty strong enough uh, leadership team in Dollar General that there there's not month to month forecast reporting to our board. But working back to the the first part of the question. So planners will, let's say, for example, someone, I'm gonna make up some numbers here. So let's say they increase their uh, their travel expense by 150% and they tell us it's for gas price. I mean, at, at first we're saying, well, gas isn't up 150%, so that doesn't make sense. But we're looking at what did they spend last year? What did they spend the year before? How has that changed annually within that certain function? and what reasonable explanation could there be for this number so thankfully i think we uh, due to five years of this system i i would say most planners know that if they if they try something like that they're going to get a a, a one hour meeting invite from us almost immediately to have them walk them through the whole thing but i think even to that end like it's that conditioning that if there's sloppiness in submissions or if they're trying to what we call pretty regularly like padding their budget or or sandbagging i think is a, a 
less nice term for it, but um, that it's setting that expectation that we're going to spot that pretty quickly. And I think that helps us on the front end kind of condition people to to be as realistic as they can, because if it's a uh, if it smells right, they really don't hear from us. But if it, it if something looks off or if it doesn't align with our understanding of the current environment, um, they're going to hear from us and we're going to ask them as many questions as we can. But at the end of the day, it's their forecast. And if they say that's what the number is and their leadership is aligned to it, that's what it is. Amazing. No, I, I love that. And I, I'm picking up that you're saying, look, you have the data at your fingertips, so it's much easier to manage the forecast and really call out, you know, <laughs> the sandbagging, which is an important skill set in, in FPA to call out in real time. So really around great gaining knowledge through your understanding of data. I love it. Okay. So another question. So Bob, I'm going to ask you this one. So mm -hmm. what's the time frame over which, you know, organizations are able to move from static forecasting to a dynamic model today? Yeah, that's a great question because it's something everybody wants to know. Um, so it really depends on a couple factors. One is how big are you, right? Are you a, a smaller player with a small number of stores, for example, or are you a dollar general approaching 20,000 stores? So that's a factor. But the reality is if you can you know, builds a kind of a prototype or what everybody likes to call minimally valuable product. I've seen things go up in three to six months um, where a core team of people can use it and then move to, you know, between the six and the nine month mark, actually get it in full production. So you could literally move up that scale one or two rungs in anywhere from, you know, three to nine months, depending on how sophisticated you want to get. Yeah. I mean, it's that Amazing. fast at times. Yeah. You're going to run into the traditional bottlenecks like availability of people and, you know, decision making on both sides and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you generally have a decent read of your data, you have a fairly reliable process, then you can certainly move in that direction in real time. Yeah, and I think that's really important to, to move there in real time, as you said. Okay, great. I'm going to come back to you. So you mentioned yep. moving away from um, version 64 of your spreadsheet. Are you still using Excel for, you know, ad hoc analysis or you kind of move completely away from it? Would love to kind of hear that. How, how have you evolved in that way? We're, we're definitely still using it, but um, that, that's a good call. It is, I think, more for those uh, ad hoc analysis or, I mean, there are certain template frameworks that you can build in Excel that are either impossible or are prohibitively difficult to build in kind of an integrated FP&A system. But at least personally, I would say more for analysis, I'm definitely utilizing um, Power BI now just as much as I can. They've got a, they've got a very good, um, almost a black box forecasting trend tool that I use extremely regularly that for something that has a, a consistent seasonality and trajectory, I mean, it it's a free tool. I think someone third party published to the the Power BI platform, but it it works better than anything else I've I've used. And um, yeah, that definitely informs Amazing. a lot of the discussions that we had, or that we that we just talked about about kind of spot checking what what people are telling us. Amazing. So, Gray, I'm going to ask you a super quick question. So how do you move from kind of GL type language to real world business language? Literally like a 15, 20 second comment would be fantastic here. That's a hard question. Um, I would say framing it within your team. So if someone else doesn't have specific uh, detail to, to what you're trying to convey, maybe ultimately to leadership, kind of working on that language with them as well. So if they can understand some of the broader terminology and what you're trying to do without getting too far into the into the weeds, as we would say, uh, that probably works well upwards as well. Yeah, perfect. And you know, educating ourselves on the business terminology to move in step. So fantastic questions. For any questions we didn't get to, we will send a response. And thank you to our amazing panelists. Okay, so upcoming uh, webinars, we've got one on the October 19th, and we've got one on November 16th. We will continue to just bring thought leadership and fantastic panelists to continue to advance our profession. 
And uh, once again, really want to thank our sponsors, Anna Plan, for bringing us this webinar where we can share thought leadership across the world. Really fantastic. And last but not least, you know, let's become part of this global community. Lots of ways, you know, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. Uh, I think Larissa and team are, are all over in, in lots of different ways. And once again, really want to thank all of you attendees. It's been fantastic to have you and really want to thank Bob and Gray for your amazing insights. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Gray. Take care, everybody. Take thank care. You.